Staff here with the Land Trust of North Alabama. If you are unfamiliar with what we do, we are a small nonprofit servicing the top 10 northern counties of Alabama through conservation, recreation, and education. Uh, we have over 7,000 acres of preserved land and eight public nature preserves. We are joining you live today from one of our nature preserves, uh, Bletcher Ford Nature Preserve, for our fourth and final segment. Fletcher Ford is actually a closed preserve out in Newmarket, Alabama. One of the reasons that it has remained closed is because there's a lot of historical significance here um, and some historical structures that remain on the property. So due to that, uh, we reached out to a friend of the Land Trust and archaeologist Ben Oxbergen to complete an archaeological survey of the area. With that, I'm going to hand things over to Ben. If you have any questions, please type them into the comments, and we are going to relay the questions to him throughout the presentation. So, Ben? Hello. Uh, my name is Ben Hawksbergen. I'm a professional archaeologist. Uh, I teach history and historical archaeology at the uh, University of Alabama in Huntsville, and I'm the cultural resource manager for Redstone Arsenal. Uh, so a few of the things uh, I do is uh, advise different organizations on how to best manage uh, cultural resources. So that's things like historic buildings, uh, archaeological sites, and cemeteries and things like that. Uh, so that's what brings me here to uh, the Fletcher Ford Preserve. Um, so like Rosie said, this is an extremely historic area. And I, and I actually, before I got into this, really had no idea how historic it was. Uh, because there hadn't been a lot of uh, information written on this area. Um, but until about uh, 60 years ago, um, we would be standing right in the middle of, a, of an actual small town. Uh, you'd never know it now, uh, but this was a, a small, unincorporated rural community that by the uh, early 1900s was known as Bletcher's Ford. Um, a little about the name Bletcher Ford, uh, that was a, a bit of a mystery when I first started here. Um, one of the theories uh, was that it was named after uh, uh, Joshua Butcher, or, or Butcher, who was a Methodist circuit preacher in the early 1800s that preached the uh, Flint River circuit of churches um, that the early settlers attended. Um, he ended up uh, uh, squatting in North Alabama before the land sales happened. Uh, but his home was over on the west side of uh, Meridianville, as far as we can tell. And we don't have any evidence that he ever lived right here. And as I did some of the, the historical research, I found out that um, until the mid-1800s or so, this area was known as Bledsoe's Ford. Um, so I researched origin of that name, and there was a early settler by the name of Dr. Wiley Bledsoe. Uh, that squatted here. He never bought land here, but he lived somewhere in the area, and uh, he probably lived on uh, other people's land. I think he died in 1816, so he would have been here after the land sales, and uh, he was probably um, just allowed to live on other people's land because he provided a service. You know, if you're on the frontier, a medical doctor is a really good person to have around. Um, so he probably lived over uh, on on the uh, Flint River Fork, uh, where there was a crossing of shoals, uh, gravelly shoals that people would have crossed in before there were uh, bridges. Um, and the name Bledsoe's Ford uh, was, uh, resulted from that. Um, by the 1860s, uh, after emancipation, uh, this area uh, became a majority African American community. And the name Bledsoe, uh, through dialectical interpretations, changed over the years. So by the 1860s, it was called Bletcher's Ford. And that evolved into uh, Bletcher's Ford by the early 1900s, and now we just call it Bletcher Ford. But throughout all those decades, uh, this, was, this was kind of its own cohesive little rural community. And this would have been the hub of it right here. Uh, we're at the fork of... Uh, the mountain fork uh, 
in what was historically known as the Barren Fork of the Flint River, where the two major branches come together, uh, right down here. And anytime you have a big convergence like that of two major drainages, uh, it's historically and, and prehistorically, we find out, uh, a hub of human activity. So already back in prehistoric times, um, we know this area was being used based on some of the artifacts we found. Uh, this entire thing, probably everything we can see is uh, prehistoric camps. You know, for thousands of years, prehistoric people would have come here, uh, probably during migration routes up and down the river, um, on hunting expeditions, or to gather hickory nuts, or any, any number of other things. Um, we know there was a major Indian trail that came down from uh, southern Tennessee and uh, probably would have at one time continued all the way up towards Nashville. It's called the Great South Trail in historic times. And it followed uh, kind of uh, in this area, the Mountain Fork down to the Tennessee River. Um, so probably going way back in, in ancient times, this is a major transportation corridor. And we know prehistoric Native Americans were transporting lots of different raw materials and exotic goods along this route. Uh, we find things like um, steatite, which is a soapstone that they uh, prehistoric people would carve bowls out of before they had pottery. Uh, we find sites with lots of steatite up towards New Market and through this corridor. Uh, greenstone is a kind of a soft uh, chlorite schist that occurs in the in the southern Appalachians that would be uh, chipped and polished into stone axes. Uh, we actually found a piece of one of those greenstone axes here on the site. Uh, so we know they were transporting all kinds of things, which is probably a major conduit for that. Um, but by the, by the 1800s, when Euro-Americans first settled here, following that same grep, the Great South Trail down into North Alabama, um, the, the area started becoming uh, rapidly developed and, and filled in with uh, early settler communities, and this was one of them. So we'd be right in the heart of the historic community right here. Um, by the uh, early 1900s, uh, there was a house over here that stood, and I found archaeological remains of that. Um, by the 1950s, it was still occupied probably by the Patterson family. Um, over here were a couple other houses, little tenant houses. Uh, may have at one time been uh, uh, slave dwellings. Uh, we know the early, early owners here. Owned, owned a lot of slaves that probably lived on site. Um, there was a tenant house right over here. Uh, there was a, a cable bridge, like a, a pedestrian suspension bridge across the Barren Fork over here uh, to other uh, tenant farm communities south of the river. Uh, this standing structure here was probably built in the 1940s by the Patterson family. And it was a, a machine shop and metalworking shop, and it was probably built on the side of a former blacksmith shop. Uh, we know there was a blacksmith here going way back to uh, probably the 1820s. Um, and we found artifacts around there, horseshoes, lots of coal and things like that that would suggest that was at one time a blacksmith shop. Um, if you walk in along the road here, you can see vestiges of all these uh, different communities. Uh, sometimes find prehistoric artifacts, <laughs> One of the, the early industrial structures is unfortunately no longer standing. Over here is the remains of probably a, a 1940s cotton gin. And uh, there was a cotton gin here uh, going back to, I believe, the 18. 70s, 1860s. Uh, this isn't it. It's, it's a silt cinder block construction, so this is definitely later, but may have been built on the original site. Uh, there's a barn from the early 1900s, what's left of it. Um, that was probably, uh, it was sealed up really good. Everything's like uh, tongue and groove and clapboard and um, 
wainscoting. So they, they kept it pretty dry and airtight. So I'm thinking it was probably a, a grain storage, maybe cotton storage. Um, and I think the Patterson family in the, in the uh, mid 20th century kind of converted it into like a, a storage building for machinery and parts and everything. Um, at one time, to the north of the cotton gin, uh, in the early 1900s at least, and, and maybe before that, there was a, a massive barn that shows up on old photographs. Uh, it apparently burned down because when I dug there, I found all kinds of burn nails, uh, mostly wire nails. So you know, it was post you know 1880, 1890 or so. Um, on the other side, there was another building that looks like it may have been a cotton warehouse where. Uh, they would have stored the cotton uh, before they ran it through the gin and turned it into refined cotton bales. And uh, the hot spot, the, the main attraction is over here, and we can walk over there and take a look at the uh, mill site. So most of the... the uh, facilities and community here has its origins uh, around 1815 with the arrival of a man named Hezekiah Ford. Uh, he was from Virginia and apparently he had a mill there. There's some references to mill papers and paperwork associated with milling um, from when he moved here from Virginia. Uh, he was a little bit of a jerk even by 19th century standards. Uh, he left a wife in Virginia, um, abandoned her, moved to Georgia initially before he made his way here in uh, 1815. Um, and once here, he married a uh, daughter of a local planter that I think was around 20 years his junior. Uh, so he still had a wife in Virginia, uh, married someone here, uh, built mills, uh, built a new mill over here, which will two vestiges of, and uh, Hezekiah Ford was really into slavery. He, he was one of the biggest slave owners here by the 1830s. Um, I think by around 1830, he owned around uh, 70 slaves. Uh, so all these, all these mills, he built one here, he had a sawmill a little upstream, and by, uh, I think, Around 1833 or so, he built a, a cotton spinning factory uh, about a mile upstream. And all these mills uh, were probably operated by slaves. Um, so there were probably slave communities, slave cabins all throughout this area where families and enslaved people live. where Hezekiah Ford's mill stood. Um, the mill changed hands many, many times throughout the uh, 1800s and early 1900s. Uh, I think by the 1830s, Huntsville had grown to the point where uh, mills and industry and the consumer base started getting really concentrated around the uh, commercial and industrial hub of Huntsville. And so some of these more uh, county areas, more hinterland sites, uh, just couldn't compete. So uh, already by 1817, Hezekiah Ford was looking to sell his mills and cash in on that. Um, but it probably stood here. Uh, the water we see is the uh, mill race, and we have every reason to believe that was the original mill race excavated by Hezekiah Ford, or, or more likely by his enslaved workforce. Um, and if we bushwhack through this foxtail here a little bit, we can see where the mill stood most likely. So I love mill sites. Historic mill sites are one of my fa favorite uh, thing to do archaeology on. Uh, because they're real puzzles, especially when you just have ruins like this, trying to figure out uh, what all the different uh, pieces of foundation and architectural elements were. Uh, probably the oldest 
part of this ruin here is this nice big dressed stone wall right along the uh, bank of the race here. Um, based on the historical research, I think that was built around uh, you know, either the late 1860s or early 1870s. There's record of the owner at the time uh, building nice big limestone foundation walls in the improvement of the mills. So that's probably the oldest feature here. Anything associated with Hezekiah Ford uh, has probably long been disturbed and uh, uh, built over. The concrete foundation or feature here uh, probably wasn't built until um, the 1930s, 40s probably, uh, when the Pattersons acquired the land and improved the mill. So what we're looking at here is uh, a turbine room. And if you can see the holes in the floors, there's two, there's one there, there's a, a nice one over here. Those are what we call the wheel pits. And, and big steel uh, water turbines would have fit down into there. And over here, there would have been a, a, a dam wall. And we can see remnants of that um, and big chunks of collapse. So all, all the water would have been backed up against here, and this would have been a mill pond. And there would have been some sort of catwalk here that they could open a sluice gate on the mill pond and let water into the turbine room. And the water would have gone down through the turbines and spun them and exited in a little tunnel under the floor. And that's what would have powered the main shaft that would turn a big um, pulley shaft up inside the mill building that would operate all the mill machinery. So this was a grist mill. This is where they ground uh, corn and, and uh, wheat, make corn meal and flour. And most of the customer base throughout history were the local farmers, local planters. Uh, they bring wagon loads of grain here, bring bags full of corn and have it ground in a meal for uh, personal consumption mostly or for uh, sale, uh, country stores and everything. There's a, actually a country store on site here for most of the early 20th century. Um, and there's also a sawmill here going all the way back to Hezekiah Ford's tenure. And I think this is the mill race. It goes up to the mountain fork where there's a, a big stone dam that may have been, it's probably the oldest historic feature on the site associated with the mill. Uh, that was probably built by Hezekiah Ford, I'm thinking. Very early construction. And it diverted water into the mill race. And there's some remains of some wooden structure up there uh, that's called a uh, uh, penstock that would have directed the water and controlled the flow of the water. And that was probably where a sawmill stood. And uh, the nails I pulled from that, I found pieces of, of timber associated with that that still nails in them. So I uh, took a sample of that. And the nail looks like it's probably about 1830s vintage. So uh, that's, a, that's a very early feature up there. So there would be a sawmill up here. This would be the grist mill. And by the time the uh, Pattersons acquired it, it was a three-story building. And uh, the first floor would have had like mill stands and maybe some uh, uh, other machinery, just some other water-powered machinery for grain processing, seed cleaners and things like that for cotton. Um, and a big belt operated that. Probably had, uh, we know it had at least two sets of big grindstones, big millstones. Uh, for grinding flour and corn um, and unfortunately uh, the reason that building's no longer here uh, most likely arsons got a hold of it in 2007 and, and uh, lit on fire in the middle of the night and burned to the ground uh, but it actually stood standing until until uh, relatively recently um, you can still see pieces of the mill here uh, the wooden structure burned down, but there's a belt pulley in the water. Um, you can see chunks of rock that were part of the foundation piers. Um, the floor would have stood about uh, uh, three feet or so above this, and there was actually an airspace. This isn't a foundation, it was just kind of a, a water retaining room. Um, 
So the floor of the mill would have stood about right here. And it looks like the door was facing upstream on the mill race. So it's probably some sort of catwalk here that they'd bring their bags of grain into, pull the wagons up to the little berm here and unload it and, and mill it on site. I think we'll walk up to the pin stock. There's a little trail I'd meet to that feature, and we'll just take a quick look at that, and maybe we'll be able to glimpse a dam from this side of the creek. And while I walk, I'll talk about some of the other characters that are associated with this place historically. I think one of the most interesting figures I learned about uh, was a man named Thomas McFarland, who owned the mills. Uh, starting, I think, in the 18, late 1850s and owned it through the Civil War. Uh, he was actually an informant for the Union Army during the Civil War. Uh, he was Scottish. He immigrated from Scotland in the early 1800s, came to New York and uh, learned milling and machine work um, and moved down here and uh, bought these mills. Um, he wasn't the next owner after Hezekiah Ford, the, the Rice family owned it in there, and the Baylisses. Uh, and there's many owners through time. It, it seems like people really had a hard time making this mill work economically. Uh, it was just too far out from the main commercial and uh, industrial hub of Huntsville. And they could never quite get into the uh, consumer base in Huntsville. There was just too much competition closer to Huntsville. So most of their consumers were just local farmers. And this was always an agricultural area, but it was never the uh, planter's paradise that more southwestern Madison County was. But most of the plantations here were, there were some decent sized ones, but nothing massive. Uh, mostly small farmers going all the way back to antebellum time. But Thomas McFarland uh, didn't rely on slaves. There's some indication he may have owned a couple enslaved people at one time. Um, but he was gen generally seems to, if not an abolitionist, he was not a, a big fan of slavery. He converted a lot of these mills to wage labor. Uh, the Rices before him likewise uh, relied heavily on wage labor. Uh, so he'd hire people from the local community to work in the mills, hired a local miller, and a local blacksmith. Uh, but it put them, the, the mills and, and just being in this part of the county uh, lent itself to kind of being able to keep tabs on what was going on in the community during the Civil War. So all these different planters and farmers would be coming to him uh, regularly and while their grain's being milled, you know, he'd be able to talk them up and get the, catch up on the local gossip. Um, and uh, a lot of people knew him from the community. Uh, a lot of people would send uh, their slaves here to get the grain milled. And uh, there's historic testimony that uh, a lot of the local enslaved community thought a lot of uh, McFarland and were very open with him. and. Uh, would help uh, feed him intelligence and uh, information and gossip. Um, and uh, he would in turn pass that on to Union troops that were in the area. Uh, this area never saw a lot of heavy action uh, during the Civil War, uh, but there was a lot of uh, what we call bushwhacker activity, uh, where uh, small kind of unofficial Confederate forces would move uh, across the Tennessee River up into uh, Limestone, Jackson County, and kind of move up and down the river corridors, um, engaging small patrols of Union troops or sabotaging the railroad and things like that. And so that was really what the Union forces were looking for here, trying to find uh, intelligence about the bushwhacker movements. And so Thomas McFarland was in a good position to spread them a lot of that information. And then uh, Somehow he managed to 
uh, remain everyone's friend throughout the Civil War. He sent his family uh, back north uh, to New York during the war uh, just to keep them safe. But he stayed working here and local planters continued to bring him their uh, grain to mill. And uh, everyone in the community spoke very highly of him. So kind of an interesting guy, you know, he's kind of walking a tightrope here. Um, but after the war, uh, he was still operating the spinning factory upstream, uh, sawmill here that we'll, we'll probably see evidence of here in a minute, and the grist mill, and uh, a cotton gin, a blacksmith shop. He was operating all these things on site uh, through the 1870s. And uh, after the war, he took out a loan, a mortgage, with a, a big planter, one of the biggest planters in Madison County. Um, and it was a, a deed of trust. So he deeded all the property uh, to this guy in exchange for funding. And he was gonna reinvest that and do a lot of improvements uh, on, the, on the industry here. And before that could happen, in uh, around 1873, 1874, the um, spinning factory burned. And there's no explanation on, you know, no one knows what caused the fire or anything, but it burned to the ground and the loss of that value caused the, the planter to foreclose on that deed of trust and uh, McFarland lost all the property. So uh, there's no telling whether there's some shady dealings or some uh, kind of revenge involved um, with his uh, uh, being an informant for the Union Army, uh, but he ended up losing everything. And he probably stayed living on the site. Um, there's some indication he stayed here and acted as the miller. Um, for the remainder of his life, but he ended up dying of pneumonia, probably from all the mill dust uh, in his lungs over the years. And uh, what, being an early settler, an informant for the uh, Union Army, and a lot of the bushwhackers had prices on his head and things like that. That didn't kill him, but the simple mill dust eventually did him in. So we're gonna walk through the trees here. There's a little bit of a, a beat down trail I've made. And we'll see if we can catch a glimpse of this wooden ruin over here. On the upstream end of the mill race, you can just catch a glimpse of the stone uh, mill dam over here. And one of the reasons I think it was probably the original mill dam, it's built of big kind of roughly dressed uh, limestone blocks. And it's just a straight up and down wall. And it's got some buttresses on the downstream end to help reinforce it. But it's, it's kind of an unusual construction for a dam. Um, most of the mill dams from the mid 1800s would have sloped upstream and been more of a, a kind of a, a ramp type construction um, that would allow some of the water to, the water pressure wouldn't be so abrupt against the face, upstream face of the wall. Uh, it kind of lessen the force as the water went up over the dam. Um, this one just a wall, uh, so I think it might be kind of early construction. May have been the original one, has a tie forward built. It directs the water into this race here, and this wasn't here. You know, this isn't a natural feature. This has all been dug by hand, probably around 1815 or so, and it goes across. I don't know if you can see it down under the water. There's a wooden frame there, made out of these big heavy timbers and it was all mortise and tenon so they've got holes cut in them that slots would have fit into for uprights that would have created a structure right here and on the upstream end of this structure 
there's remains the very bottoms of these big, wide, vertical boards uh, that all uh, probably cut uh, by the sawmill on site, likely. Not, not for sure there, but they're, wrong. they're nailed on there with cut nails, so probably like 1830s era nails. And that would have created a dam up here that probably would have had some sort of gate in it to control the flow of the water. So the water would have been directed around one end of it through this wooden structure, which we call a pin stock. And there probably would have been some sort of horizontal water wheel or maybe a, a small uh, undershot water wheel where the water goes under it to turn the wheel instead of over the top. And I'm guessing that's what powered the sawmill. Uh, it's definitely some sort of historic feature. There's remains of big masonry uh, stone buttresses downstream. There were three of them at one time. Two of them have collapsed. That one's still standing. Um, I'm not sure how those fit into this. They, they may have reinforced this whole pin stock. Um, they may have been footers for the sawmill which stood over the mill race. But either way, this is, this is a very early, probably early to mid 1800s feature here. And it's kind of interesting. Wood, wood preserves very well if it's submerged in an anaerobic uh, environment like this. Uh, the few boards I sampled had been washed out probably in a flood and were uh, along the bank and in a gravel bar. Once that wood gets out of the water, it deteriorates very quickly if you don't like impregnate it with resin or something else to preserve it. Um, so I preserved a couple of those boards. Uh, they had remnants of cut nails in it, so I ran the cut nails through electrolysis to get off all the rust and clean them up and stabilize them with a wax coating. Um, so we have some some uh, artifacts associated with this before, you know, you never know uh, when a big flood could come and uh, damage this further. So preserve what we can. Um, maybe we can take a casual stroll back to the truck and take a pause or something while we walk. I've got some artifacts uh, on the back of my tailgate that we can take a look at that I found in the survey. <laughs> Still rolling? <laughs> All right. Um, one of the things that makes this area really interesting to me is that uh, geologically, a lot of things are coming together here. We'll talk a little bit about the natural history of this. Um, you know, not only do we have two major branches of the Flint River converging here, but the, the reason they have their historic names, the Mountain Fork and the Barren Fork, have a lot to do with the, the physiography of the area. Uh, the Mountain Fork kind of flows to the east and north, uh, to New Market and points beyond in the southern Tennessee, uh, where it's in the uh, physiographic region known as the Jackson County Mountains, which is uh, the southern end of the Cumberland Plateau. Uh, that's a really mountainous area. It was uplifted geologically uh, very early and uh, a lot of the bedrock's limestone and over time that limestone dissolves into caves and sinkholes and uh, canyons and if you've spent much time in the heart of Jackson County, uh, it's very rugged. You know, we've got a lot of these heavily dissected tablelands we call them. These, plateaus that have been eroded down with these very deep, long, narrow uh, canyons and valleys. Um, so that's one physiographic region. And those uplands would have their own set of resources. You know, there's a lot of uh, plants in particular that occur there uh, that you don't get elsewhere. Um, there's mineral resources there. There's a lot of caves that you don't get elsewhere. A lot of uh, uh, salt springs and things like that that would have been valuable to prehistoric people and historic people. 
And the Barren Fork, what we just call the Flint River now, flows up towards uh, Hazel Green in northern Madison County and, and points to the west. And it was called Barren Fork because historically it drained an area known as the Barrens, um, which are just kind of opposite terrain. Uh, it's, it's more uh, what you see like in Madison, uh, places north of Huntsville and west of Huntsville, where it's just kind of nice rolling terrain, uh, sometimes called the Redlands, you know, the soil's all eroded from limestone bedrock. Um, fairly good farmland. It would have had more of a, a patchy prairie, almost savanna-like um, vegetation and would have had its own set of resources that would be different from uh, the Cumberland Plateau ecosystems. So prehistoric people would love places like this because they could, they could live here and exploit two different ecological zones. Uh, have a broader resource base. And vertically, uh, we're also at a, a crossroads of sorts. So over here in a mountain fork from the mill dam going upstream, you see a lot of this heavy black shale along the bottom. Um, and that's the Chattanooga Shale. Uh, it's a Ordovician rock, so it's very old. Um, it was uh, probably like a, kind of a coal swamp environment and the top of it got eroded off in, in uh, very ancient times and a whole new set of uh, layers got laid down on top of it so it was probably uplifted, eroded down to that shale which is very erosion resistant and then the oceans uh, moved uh, farther inland like it was probably got uh, dropped down again. The oceans moved in and started laying down limestone on top of that. So there's a nice, and this was this was millions of years later. So there's there's a we call it an unconformity where the bedrock erodes and then millions of years later it starts getting laid down again. And after that it's a Port Payne formation, and the lower part of that is just chock full of fossils. So it's this uh, green shale layer about this thick, and if you break that shale apart, it's full of it's just almost entirely little marine fossils, little crinoid stem segments, uh, brachiopods, uh, little shelled organisms that are about that big, um, and other things. So you find a lot of cool fossils here too. All right, here's just a, a small smattering of the artifacts that I collected as part of this survey. Um, most of the artifacts, I found uh, hundreds of artifacts most of them are artifacts that only an archaeologist could love. Uh, little pieces of broken glass, old nails, um, little pieces of, of dinnerware and ceramics. Um, the prehistoric artifacts were mostly little chips of flint that were, uh, we call them flakes. They were the byproducts of stone tool manufacture and maintenance. Um, but even some of those were utilized. This is one I actually found on the surface, but you see it's got working along the edge. Um, it would have just been flaked off a big chunk of local flint, which they could have found in the uh, riverbeds here. That's why it's called the Flint River. Uh, so this is local chert or flint. They broke this flake off and then worked around some of the edges, either working it into what we call a preform to turn into a, a spear point or other tool, a knife or something, or they just used it like this as a, a scraper or something. Um, but this has a he very heavy patina, we call it. It's the weathered surface. And when you see surfaces this weathered, uh, you know it's very old, probably uh, middle archaic or older. So this thing's probably in excess of uh, 6,000 years or more. And this is that little uh, fragment of greenstone axe I mentioned. So this is a stone that doesn't occur around here. It's a chlorite schist, probably uh, from the Hillaby Formation down in uh, East Central Alabama. Uh, would have been imported here probably as a finished tool. And the original was probably about that long. Uh, we just have the very end of it. Uh, it would have been chipped into shape and then polished, uh, rubbed against a, a slab of sandstone or something to polish it smooth. 
and a completed thing would have been like teardrop shape with a cutting end on this end. The socket would fit into a hole in the wooden handle and they'd use it as a wood chopping implement. Um, and we usually don't see uh, greenstone celts. We call them celts because they're not grooved axes. Uh, usually don't see those until the woodland period, probably the middle woodland period when people started using burial mounds and were more tied into a uh, regional exchange network. So that was kind of fun to find. I don't know if you can see this. I'll put it in my hand so there's no glare. This was kind of a neat little artifact to find. It's a pressed glass bead, black glass bead. Probably from a lady's garment. Um, this came from one of the tenant house sites probably dates to the late 1800s, early 1900s. Just a pretty little glass bead and uh, the same scatter had a, uh, it was ugly, so I, I, I'm not showing you, it was just very fragmentary, but a little piece of a china doll, a little bisquare doll. Um, so little indications like that are fun, you know, the families actually lived here, you know, these weren't just uh, men running the mill uh, but this was a whole community of, of families and kids would have been running around uh, pets uh, one of my favorite features on the uh, mill dam there are concrete repairs done to it probably by the Pattersons in the uh, mid 1900s and one of those uh, concrete patches is just full of little cat footprints there's all these little paw prints so you can just imagine you know all these farm cats and dogs and chickens you know if, I found uh, what we call gastroliths, which are the, the polished things inside a chicken gizzard. You know, they pick up pieces of rock and gravel and sand, and even artifacts will pick up like chert flakes from prehistoric sites or pieces of glass or china. And all those things help grind up the chicken's food, but you find these things on these historic sites and you find, you know, glass ones and ceramic ones. So, you know, there were yard chickens running all through here, probably pigs and sheep and cows hive of activity so this is one of those 1830s 1840s cut nails um, that was from one of the timbers of the pin stock up at the up end upstream end of the mill race and you can see it's not rusty I've ran this through a special process called electrolysis to remove all the rust remove the oxidation but it's a it's a cut nail probably about a 30 penny cut nail it's got a little domed head a rose head which is somewhat diagnostic and here's just a couple of the tools that I found um, there was a blacksmith shop probably standing right behind us uh, all kinds of uh, machinery running here that uh, mechanics and machinists would have worked on over the years so here's a mill file and a a crescent wrench that would have been used in those efforts. Just some of the a little more photogenic things I found. But, um, what do you use to determine the age of the tools? Tools are a little tricky. Um, a mill file from uh, 1806 probably would have looked just like one you buy at Lowe's today. You know, this this one was found in a crawl space under the barn over there. Uh, so it's probably 20th century, um, just based on that association, but it's really hard to date. Um, crescent wrenches like this, I don't think they really came around until um, early early 20th century. Uh, but some more simple wrenches look, you know, from the Roman Empire look look the same. So there's a lot of guesswork involved. Um, there's patents. You can you can rely on patent literature. Uh, to figure out how old things are. Uh, there's a whole typology of, of nails, um, figuring out how old nails are. Uh, we've got patents, we've got historic architecture has been dismantled and sampled for nails. Um, and actually helped me, the, the Goddard House on Redstone Arsenal, it was like an 1830s uh, plantation house that was moved in the 1950s and uh, was too heavily modified to preserve. We tore it down a few years ago on the arsenal and I salvaged as much of the nails as possible. And this is very similar to the nails that I found in it. So I'm gonna use that sample. Uh, prehistoric tools uh, and artifacts, you can 
date those through relative dating uh, by comparing them to similar ones found on other sites that have been uh, more carefully dated or where they occur in different layers on the site. Um, one of the interesting things I found in the survey was that the central part of the site has what we call stratified deposits. So these are where uh, the river alluvium would accumulate over time and bury earlier deposits. So you get layers of things where the oldest stuff's on the bottom and the more recent stuff's on top. Um, that's kind of unusual in the Flint River Valley. Um, geologically, the uh, Flint River Valley is extremely stable where you can have sites uh, from the Ice Age that are right up against the river and haven't been buried or eroded away. Um, it floods a lot, but the uh, bed load is very coarse. So all the gravels are these chert gravels that erode out of the limestone. And those don't erode very fast. They don't dissolve like limestone. Uh, and they kind of inhibit the river from meandering and uh, cutting new channels. Uh, so it was, it was curious to me to find, you know, this was about this far down, I found a layer of prehistoric artifacts. In fact, this silt came from uh, about that deep, about a foot and a half down. Um, so that makes the site all the more significant that it's actually got these preserved prehistoric deposits. Uh, that all this, you know, 170 some years of historic activity uh, haven't disturbed. Well, that's about all I have today. Are there any questions about anything? Uh, we didn't. I think you were very succinct. Good. So, <laughs> I think we're good. But right. um, thank you, Ben, so much for coming out and doing this, all the work you've done out here and right. sharing it with us. Um, super interesting. And I'm so glad that you all joined us. If you haven't checked out our other speaker series that we have done, they are on our Facebook. There's three other ones. We hope you've enjoyed them. We've really enjoyed all the learning that has happened. And I want to say a big thank you to the Education Committee for doing their part to make this happen. So thank you so much. We'll do more of these next year. We hope to see you then.